Welcome back to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, where you'll find information on what's going on on the North Fork of Long Island. We'll be focusing on issues and opportunities going on in the community, as well as people and stories from the present and the past. I'm your host, Christopher Bianchi, and we're back today with Michael Hitman again for part two, and we'll be continuing on starting with his time in college and what he wanted to do and getting involved with anthropology and being a professor at Long Island University in the Department of Anthropology, as well as his time out in Nevada working with Native Americans and coming up to his new book talking about uh, the Brooklyn Paramount Theater. So I hope you enjoy the second part with Michael Hitman and we'll get right into it. I went to college and I I met this anthropologist. I thought he was, you know, the cat's meow. His name was Leon Cinder. He was an anthropologist. He was a dwarf. And he was so brilliant and so smart that my jaws dropped. And and I thought, whatever he is, I wanted to be a lawyer at that point. Clarence Darrell was my hero. (laughs) And I became an anthropologist. I thought, if this is a way to look at the world, I didn't want to be him. I didn't want to be a dwarf. Excuse me. You know, I was short, but and I was self-conscious. But the, he was so smart, and if that's the way of looking at the world, I want it. So I majored in mm-hmm. anthropology, and he was so nice to me. He didn't have kids, and I, you know, I glommed on to him, I guess, or it was one of, his, and he knew. I mean, he knew who he had. Any teacher knows, you, you know, if you have a student who's really into you, mm-hmm. and I know teachers who would exploit that whether for sex, whether for, you know, oh yeah, you come and help me, I'm moving on to, I, I was very aware of kids who were needy and needed fathers. Mm. And I did not, yeah. I never, I never exploited that. I never did. And I knew it, it, also, it made me a little uncomfortable. Leon knew he had his crew. And, but he always said to me, listen, kid, if you ever get a degree in anthropology, give me a call, I'll get you a job. So when I finished and I got a degree, I called him up. Mm-hmm. from New Mexico, and he gave me a job at Long Island University. So, see, and then I worked with him, and it was a disaster. Because uh-huh. it, he was a disaster at the end of his career. And it was a humiliation and a disaster. So, you know, so much for heroes, and so much for growing up, and being your own man, and not being a kid, you know, like, ooh, 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 you know, Taylor Swift, ooh, 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 ooh. You, you know, being... Now, I wind up with the Indians, Okay, I'm, I'm an undergraduate at LIU. I'm in the jazz program and playing with my brother. And I'm an anthropologist. I want to be an anthropologist. Mm-hmm. And, and then I had a chance. Um, uh, and LIU it was the school of second chances. If you couldn't get in anywhere else, you could always get into LIU. Mm. That's, what, that's what my guidance counselor said. It's mm. a school of second chances. I wasn't a dope. I just didn't apply myself in high school. I didn't have an average enough... In 1959, if you were in high school with me in Seward Park, if you had an 84 average, you could get in to any like CUNY, Hunter, any of the schools. Mm. If you were a girl, you had to have an 88 average. Ha ha ha. They made it twice as tough on girls. Can you imagine the sexism? I had an 82 average. I never applied myself. I was so busy working in slavery for my father that I did my work and I, you know, whatever I did, I never knew that you needed an 84. I could have gotten an 80. So I got to pay for college. Oh, my poor parents. They're going to have to pay for me for college before they want me to go. So it'll take a bank loan. NYU is $30 a credit. Okay, Columbia is mm. 35. I didn't get into Columbia. LIU is $25 a credit. The guidance counselor says, ah, oh, don't worry, you can always go to LIU to take everybody. So I went to LIU, they took me right in, they took the money right away. <laughs> I had a first rate education. I met a first rate anthropologist and I got a full fellowship. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, I, I did my work in college. I wasn't gonna like screw up. I was motivated, I was 18, I, was, I studied hard. Mm. I did the best I could. I wasn't the smartest, but I wasn't the dumbest. I wasn't a straight A student. I got a full fellowship to NYU. Oh, in anthropology. Like, wow, mm-hmm. I can go to school for free. I'm off my parents' back. Yeah. In NYU, well, everybody gets a PhD. You can't do anything with a master's degree, Mike. What are you going to do? I don't know. I'll teach. I got invited by the by the chairman of the anthropology 
University of New Mexico, I my, my commitment. You want to come out to the Harvard of the West? We're offering you a full, a full ride. So I said, all right. So I went <laughs> to Albuquerque, and then I got interested in American Indian studies. Simply, my father liked the cowboys. I liked the Indians. Mm -hmm. Got to be a little opposition. You grew up watching the movies. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, I liked the cowboys, but I couldn't like the cowboys because my father loved the cowboys. So the Indians were always these dopes. Mm. You know, the cowboy shoots 100 shots from a six shooter and they murder 500 Indians and it's great. I wasn't like an Indian lover, mm -hmm. but there was a part of me, you know, because my father loved the cowboys. I love cowboy. I, my best friend was a cowboy. But the point was when I had to pick something to study in New Mexico and it was s s the best program there, Native American studies. Mm -hmm. So I gravitated to Native American studies. And what happened was I was going to Turkey, as I remember, I was going to Turkey on an archaeological dig at NYU. I don't want to do archaeology. It's too much like stamp collecting. I yeah. used to stamp collecting. Yep. Have you done? Have you, I've done. I've done some philately. Okay. It, it, you know, going to the excavator site, which I worked on one, you got to find the pieces of pottery and put them together and draw and them. Label and it and everything. It made me my sugar. It made me crazy. And as someone once said, you're either interested in drawing um, uh, facts from people or people from facts. You know, a little pot. And a, so this guy must have been smoking a pot. And then, and then mm. you know, you were reconstructing a culture as opposed to drawing facts from people, interviewing people. Yeah, right there in front of. So that's what happened. I, I went to a training program. I, I got invited. I applied. A friend of mine, serendipity. Or, or fate, you know, karma, mm -hmm. you know, what are you doing? This friend in graduate school at NYU, I said, I don't want to go on that dig with, I was invited to go to Turkey. It would have been fun to go to Turkey. But I don't know. She said, oh, look, there's this program at the University of Nevada in Reno, and it's for graduate students to come to learn to do it. So I just sent up an application, I got invited. So I, I got invited and we were trained how to interview people like you're interviewing me mm -hmm. and how to take notes, mm -hmm. whether to use pen or pencil. And you take a note, then you have to type it up. After you type it up, you cross it out with a lot, you know, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Tape recorder, how to do genealogies, you know, and all of that stuff. And, uh, and they pick names out of a hat. Where are you going to go? Which reservation? Yeah. To pick my name out of they picked a place called Yarrington, Nevada, out of a reserv out of a hat, mm -hmm. and you know I'm you know I'm 24 years old, and you got Mike pack your bags and get on the bus and go to Yarrington and f go to so and so and rent the room, and here are the two reservations and introduce yourself to the chairman and and go do field work, f find people who will sit and talk to you. Mm -hmm. I went to church the first time. I thought I'm going to go to the church because I carried my guitar with me. And, I, you know, I always played the guitar. I still play the guitar. And I thought, well, you know, the church is good. Maybe I'll play the guitar in the church. And then maybe I'll meet people that way. And mm -hmm. sure enough, so I went to the church. I introduced myself. And this guy, like, I don't want to say, I like him. He was from Kansas. Mm -hmm. He was a grinning, you know, Bible thumper. Uh, and he, he said, I got me a Jew boy. And if I can convert me a Jew boy, maybe the, Jesus will come back sooner. That's what mm -hmm. that's what came back to me. I was a Jew boy. And when I used to play the guitar, and they were waiting for me to, you know, fall down on the floor. They're holy rollers and roll mm -hmm. around. And I never did. And always the eyes were staring at me. And I got the point. But I'm, I'm tough-minded. I wasn't converting. But at when I met this preacher, I went to his trailer. There was two Indians over there. And they were just staring at me. And I was like, yeah. The Indians, I got to meet them. And the woman said to me, come to my house on Sunday for dinner without even, I said, okay. So I got an invite and like the man who's, the man who, the man who went to dinner and stayed, whatever, I never left their house. Mm -hmm. I met these Indians. He was a Mexican Indian. She was a Paiute Indian, local to reservation. And I went for dinner and I absolutely fell in love with them. And they absolutely fell in love with me. And I got, I was invited to live with them. I lived with them. You have to live someplace on a reservation. Oh, you mm -hmm. have to get a car. And, and I separated. I never really interviewed them, but I interviewed other people. And um, that was a really turning point in my life. Um, 
because I began studies, a lifetime of studies of this one particular reservation, you know. So, you know, I, I get, jazz, this, like this fiction, the th my, three, my three demons were American Indians studies, and I have a book of short stories, The Indians Won't Let Me Live. And I became really interested in Indians, and I still am. Um, and then jazz, I became interested in jazz, and especially when my brother died. And then we'll get to the, you know, get to the, the Brooklyn Paramount. Um, I had a master's degree, and uh, I went for a PhD. And uh, cultural anthropologists were expected to do field work, um, not a library dissertation. Mm -hmm. And field work is field work is going to a place in the world, and you know, setting up shop, and um, learning another language, and interviewing people uh, with a subject in mind. And because I had done the training. Um, and in, in Yer it's Yerrington, Nevada. It's near Carson City, and there are two reservations: the Yerrington Indian Colony, ten acres, mm -hmm. one hundred and twenty people, and a large thousand-acre reservation called Campbell Ranch, and you know seventy-five, one hundred people there, and the ten miles from apart from each other. In this small rural town, which for me was fascinating, mm -hmm. to get away from the Lower East Side. <laughs> it's like I'll, a total opposite. Oh my God! Just. Chris, just to take a walk at night at seven o'clock in this hot summer night and just it's safe, it's safe. and you know, cicadas See and the sky the and heat the stars. And the star. It was beautiful. I mean, it was, it was, it was just beautiful. And, but the lives of Indians were, were not, was not beautiful, were not mm -hmm. beautiful. I mean, this is, these are this, how do you, how do you maintain insanity in an insane world? You mm -hmm. know, how do you how do you hold on to beauty in, in in a world with so much you know horrible things happening? You know, to other people when you know you know Mel Brooks when it happens to you it's a it's a his comedy when it happens to me it's a tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm having a good time, but it's a, you're a tragedy. Well, tough shit. You know, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. like my father once said somebody had a flat tire. Better you than me. Mm. I understand that, and it, but it's cruel. But we all think that. Yes. You know, yes. I've broken down in a car, and people are staring and honking and giving me fingers, and right. obviously, I don't want to be there. And you know, you're looking no. for help, and I have empathy. You have empathy. So, <laughs> I'm going to do field work, and I don't know what I'm going to write about. I finished my coursework. I did very well. I took the comprehensive exams, like man, twelve hours of written exams. Um, I do orals, <laughs> you know, and face 12 people. And so help me God, there was one question I didn't answer. Now I'm bragging. I'm facing people <laughs> who want to help me get through this. Yes, yes. They, because, you know, they, I did my comprehensive and now I have to do my orals. Mike, tell us about Franz Boas and his relationship with uh, uh, Alfred Krober. And, you know, da, 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 mm. da. And there was one guy... He asked me a question about Eskimo archaeology. Mm. I'll never forget this. He was the chairman of the department. And there are sequences. The Dorset culture, the Thule culture. I screwed it up. So when they sent me out, like a room, you know, like into a hallway, so like a room like this with the table and the 12 faculty, <laughs> they kept me out for the longest time. Oh. I was scared, you know. <laughs> I was scared. <laughs> like, oh, my God, you know, I must have failed. It, it's gonna, they're going to fail me. And when I come back, they clap. So I say, oh, wow. And when I sit down, the chairman says, very, very good job. However, I have to say something to you. you. Mike, you really screwed up. Now, let me tell you about the Eskimo. And he proceeds to lecture me mm -hmm. about Eskimo archaeology, which is fine. And I was mm -hmm. sitting there like this. I won't say the F-bomb, but like F you, F you, F you, mm -hmm. F you, F you. I, I was done. You know, but I was happy, but he had to do that. He had his last chance, you know, to, to rub my to, nose. All yeah. right, you know, get off the way. You, everybody has to get off the way they have to get. Off. Meanwhile, what am I going to write about? Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm going to write about. You need a dissertation subject. And it, there's inductive research and there's deductive. You go to a place with ideas in mind and you collect the information. Or you go there and like jazz musicians, <laughs> you're supposed to improvise. Yes. So yeah. I had a topic. It was this stu I won't even tell you. It was the stupidest topic in the world, and I'm researching 
this topic. Maybe it could have been a dissertation with enough intelligence and enough creativity. I could have gotten information, maybe turned it into some jive. So, so here, this is this is the truthful part. Radio, ra those of you in radio land, you can turn your radio off or on your call. This is the truth, baby. Um, pot, my, you know, black men were being put in prison for 20 years. And, 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 you know, with the Rockefeller laws. But during the hippie period, and I was a hippie, uh, marijuana was like the, the drug of pleasure. Um, mm -hmm. And there were other drugs, and the LSD, I've taken LSD, peyote, I used peyote in Indian ceremonies, I'm not bragging, just talking. And I was, I hated smoking. And I, 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 you know, smoking a joint, I was nothing I would ever do except sometimes to do it because other people would do it. It slowed my sense of time down. I didn't like it. But but I lived in a house in Albuquerque with a guy and a family, and he was, well, one of them was selling, you know, marijuana. They were harvesting it in Kansas, and, and the other one was actually selling, you know, co cocaine and other stuff. And, you know, these are the 60s, and there was a drug period, and I had marijuana with me. I, I didn't ever smoke it. I would never smoke it. But I found an Indian man, uh, his name was Corbett Mack, and um, I went in 1965. In 1964, a, a woman, an Irish woman, was there, and I read her notes, and she said, if all else fails, go to interview Corbett Mack. He's an old man, he lives alone, and he's very helpful. Mm -hmm. So I was looking around for people. So I went out to meet Corbett. He was the most wonderful old man I have ever, ever met. And I used to sit and interview him, <laughs> and he was, and I, and we paid people. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea was, you know, you didn't just go there. Frankly, he was a guy who wanted me to bring him wine, instead of payment. And I did it once, and it was a mistake. His his niece reamed me out, rightfully so. Uh. And then he wanted me to take him to town, and and I'd pay him, and then he would buy wine, and then I stopped doing that. Mm -hmm. So now I'm a good guy. I just give him money, and he found people who got the wine. So we're just mm -hmm. talking about different things. And I actually rolled a joint. It was so beautiful and quiet. And and to talk to Corbett was like to ask a question, and 10 minutes would go by. Mm. Hey, Corbett, what was your mother's name? <laughs> he would just go... Oh. And the tapes, you listen to the tapes, like, there ain't nothing happening, man. <laughs> Where's the juice? There's no, like, jazz. But I learned to slow down. It was a small town and everything like that. And he would always roll uh, Prince Albert pipe tobacco in these wheat straw papers. Mm -hmm. And he'd roll himself a cigarette, and he'd offer me a cigarette, and I would smoke a cigarette with him. I didn't, I did not cough. I didn't like it. So one day, I, I don't know why, but I, 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 I rolled a joint, or I had a joint, and he said to me, what are you smoking, partner? Because I wasn't smoking here. I said, it's okay, Corbett. He says, what are you smoking, partner? I said, oh, Corbett, you know, like, you, without saying this, you're just an old Indian man. You wouldn't, you're just an old drunk. You wouldn't know anything about marijuana. Mm. So I said, oh, you know, Corbett, you know, the hippies, you watch television, and they're demonstrating, and I'm kind of, cause I have long hair, and I have long beard, I'm a hippie. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, these people... You know, these white people, they like to smoke this thing called marijuana. He said, oh, marijuana. He said, if you really want to get high, Mike, get some opium. Mm. So Mike said, what? And and he and I said, uh, you know, well, I've never, I mean, I know the Chinese used to smoke opium. You know, like, I tell him, like, I'm lecturing him. And uh, I know about opium from, you know. Even McCabe and Mrs. Miller, that movie dealt with, you know, opium. Mm, yes. Cap Calloway had all these songs about on the gong and opium. And Corbett said, oh, yeah, he said, I, I use that. But then there's better stuff, too. M Mike, morphine is better. Heroin is better. Mm. So Mike's, like, eyes and ears are going, like, ha, ha, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ee, ah, ooh, ooh. And I start going to the library to look up old newspapers, and sure enough, every day another Indian is arrested. Another Indian, a Paiute, is arrested for opium, buying it, selling it, and another one, and another one. I went up to Carson City for the prison records. All these people were in prison, they're felons. What the hell happened? Everybody was using opium there. 
I never heard about that. If I told my mentor, they would say, what? Well, you must be smoking too much opium. You know? <laughs> ah, you know. No, man, I get to look, look at this. So, so it just pause with me for one second. I, I, I believe in miracles. I do believe in miracles. Um, my Indian mother, Ida May, used to think I had buha. Buha is power, is supernatural power. And I don't want to mystify things, but I, I, I brought two of my students. We drove cross country to the reservation and, and then they flew home and it was fun. I had somebody to share a cross country drive with me. And then I had a dream that Mary had a baby and the head of the baby was too big and they had to do a C-section. And mm -hmm. then sure enough, I had a phone call from Fred and Mary and I said, hey, oh, you know, Mary had this terrible thing. She had a baby, the head was too big. So I tell Ida May the story and Ida May says, yeah, Buha. Yeah. And Buha is very dangerous. I don't have Buha. Buha is what shamans had. But these experiences that I, that I feel like I've had suggest something really, really crazy. So I go to this, I, they pick a, out of a hat, uh, Yarrington, Nevada. I don't know nothing about Yarrington. I read about it. Mm -hmm. It turns out it was the place where the ghost dance religion began. If there's anything famous in American history about Indians, it's the Wounded Knee Massacre. Bingo. That's in South Dakota. The Wounded Knee Massacre happened in December 29th, you know, 1890. And it was Indians in South Dakota who heard about a guy with Buha in Yarrington, Nevada, who had a vision from God. Mm -hmm. And all these Indians converged upon this one Indian where I was doing field work. This is now 18, I'm there in 1965, in 1890, in 1888, 89, 90, there was a man named Jack Wilson, that's what everybody called him. Mm -hmm. And he had an Indian name. He had a lot of Indian names. And one of them in translation is Wavoka, the, the woodcutter. Long, yes, yes. W is somebody, if you cut wood, you know, you'd be Wukhavi, you then become a name, Wavoka. Mm -hmm. It's Chris, he's cutting wood. Oh, Wavoka, oh. He, but he's Jack Wilson. And um, really famous books about him, um, several books about him. Mike Hitman starts reading books about him. And, you know, and what happened with the ghost dance, which, ex which, is, which explains Trump, you know, which now I'm going to get political for a minute. People don't, I don't understand how these people can like this guy when he's a fraud, he's a fake, he's everything crooked about, everything wrong about America. His father was a fascist. He's a, well, if you could understand that Indians who have a rifle, and know that a rifle is better than a, a bow and arrow and a spear for killing a buffalo, mm -hmm. and then say to somebody like the United States troopers, cavalry, you got a rifle, I got a rifle, all got children got rifles, but here's the difference. You could shoot me, I could shoot you with my rifle and you dead, but if you shoot me with your rifle, I'm bulletproof. Mm. Now, how could they believe that? Well, they, you can only believe these incredible beliefs if you're down. And, and this is a concept of deprivation. If I feel deprived, I may have a swimming pool and a yacht and a skyscraper and a Mark Cuban, that clown who owns the Dallas, $3.4 billion. Mm -hmm. If he feels deprived with all that money and kills himself, which happens, he felt deprived and you would say, Man, if I had the Dallas Mavericks and if I had $3.4 billion and I'm on the <laughs> shark tank, you know, the, the, the depression people were killing themselves with millions. People today feel threatened and, you know, the immigrants are coming. And, you know, John, mm -hmm. and John, Wayne, and John Wayne is the president. He wears a long coat, the searchers. This guy's like John Wayne Trump. He walks in with the long coat, the long tie, and people think he's the messiah. And he knows how to work it, and he's a demagogue. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing political. If anybody doesn't want to listen, don't. I, I'm not saying that. I'm explaining. I think what the ghost dance movement that we're in right now. It's impossible to explain how people who are educated could actually fall for this. How senators, the corruption. Okay, so get to the point. How could these Indians in South Dakota believe that Jack Wilson is the Messiah? Well, you know what. 
In their case, they lost all the buffalo, they were starving, they were put on reservations, they were given rations, the government is there with rifles, and they went to Nevada, and they met this guy, didn't even speak the same language, and when they came back and said, the Messiah, he came to help us, and he said, he said we should dance mm -hmm. in a circle, and the white man's bullets won't hurt us, and if we dance, and dance, and dance, the dead will come back, the white man will be destroyed, there'll be an earthquake, and everything is going to be, make America great again. I'm drawing a, a parallel, mm -hmm. and it's a perfect parallel. I'm not going to clap my hands, because it'll, but as when I would teach, when I would lecture, I would say the dead are dancing in one direction, clockwise, uh, the dead are dancing counterclockwise, and the living are, are dancing clockwise, and if we could get the circles to, and I'll clap my hands gently, boom, something happens. Now, what happened in South Dakota was when they started dancing the ghost dance, the cavalry was threatened, and they tried to disarm them, and the last thing you could do is take a gun away from a man, and then there was a massacre. Mm. In Nevada, Jack Wilson shut it down, because he thought he was gonna be arrested and blamed for what happened in South Dakota. He says, I'm not talking about it. He said, yes, I saw God. Yes, I was told I could make this world over again. Yes, I'm bulletproof. And uh, no, I didn't tell them to do that. And I'm not talking about it anymore. Hmm. That's the end of it. Now, I arrive in 1965, and I, I, I meet his daughter. And she serves me a nice slice of apple pie at, hmm. the, at the train station. Her name is Alice, Alice Wilson. Oh, Alice Wilson, I find out. And I said, oh, Alice, you know, I'm Michael Hitman, and I'm the leader of the band, and I'm, you know, <laughs> from the Lower East Side, and I'd love to talk to you about my father. No, the white man lied about my father. I don't tell you nothing. I give you apple pie. You want a sandwich? I said, yeah. <laughs> so I ate a sandwich and apple pie. But it turns out there were other people who were part of his family, and it turns out that his whole family were junkies. His brother, his other daughter. This is through my... Remember what I said about research. Research is finding out what everybody else knows, or it's basically finding out what you, quote, discovered. If it's in the newspapers, you didn't discover shit, man. Mm -hmm. It's just in the papers. People didn't pay attention to it. And I brought it up. So all I did was bring up all these newspapers and all these prison records, and it got me in, a really, it got me in really big trouble. Um, Indians didn't like me because I was basically, you know, telling the truth or telling history, writing history. Mm -hmm. And um, I read a paper in Carson City. I thought it was a really smart paper and it was an honest paper. And this was the title of the paper, uh, Never Mix, Never Worry. Mm. Corbett used to say, when I used opium, I never drank. When I didn't have opium, I drank. I never wanted to mix the two because you lose your mind. Never mix, never worry, which is a line from Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Uh, and the heuristic value of offering a joint to an informant. So, because I offered him that joint, he opened up this whole window, and I got a dissertation out of it. Uh, at the conference, this reporter came to see me, and he said, I'd like to talk to you about the paper that you've uh, delivered. Uh, so I said, hey, you're not going to, like, uh, you know, splash a headline and, you know, and, you know, knock me down. Uh, he said, oh, no, no, we're just writing it. Headline, Nevada State Journal, anthropologist offers marijuana to Indians. <laughs> oh. My wife flipped. She said, that's the end of our career. Nothing happened. Thank mm -hmm. goodness. I could have been banned. I could have been a persona non grata. I wrote a dissertation about the ghost dance and opium. And the idea was, did these Indians turn to opium because everything failed? Like the ghost dance promised a new world and they didn't mm -hmm. get it. So then they retreated, Robert Merton retreated to opiates. Mm -hmm. And, and for, don't need to go with the argument, but the, the argument was no, because Jack Wilson, he didn't promise the destruction of the world actually. He promised that if you're a good boy and a good Indian, you know, you would get a reward in heaven. So work for the white man, okay? And you'll get a reward in heaven. It's mm -hmm. not, and maybe heaven will explode and, but. But, and others turned it around inside out and said, no, he said that the white man is evil. Don't work for the white man. Dance and destroy the world. The white man will be destroyed. Jack Wilson said, his, his vision from God was, 
I have selected you to be in charge of, there's a president in the East and the, you'll be the president of the West. So it's mm -hmm. going to be like a biracial, like Israel, like a two-party system. Mm -hmm. I'm God. I'm going to be in charge. And you, Jack, you'll be in charge of the West, <laughs> including the white men of the West. <laughs> that was his vision. And, and mm -hmm. he used to say, pay me. If they'd interviewed him, he would say, pay me. I'm president of the world. He'd walk around like he was president. Of course, white people used to think he was an a-hole. Look at this uppity Indian. Who the hell does he think he is? Mm. He actually believed his vision. He believed it until the end. Now, he was never made president of the West. He was the <laughs> governor of Nevada, and governor of Idaho, and governor, you know. But he maintained this prestige. And meanwhile, the world is collapsing. Everyone's a junkie. His daughter, they're all dying of overdose. Mm -hmm. It's a, a tragedy beyond belief. So I wrote that dissertation, and then I got famous. I did a, a life history of Corbett Mack who I loved. And it was all about opium and, you know, and everything like that. And I read a lot about it and I learned a lot about it. And then a lot of drugs in my family, my brother. And then that, that's what, so, so that's the Indian, that's the Indian component in my mm -hmm. anthropology. And, and I've had, you know, a lot of books and I've had several articles and a couple more I'd like to write. But honest to God, it was the day I was cursed. Because on the one hand, I was, I'm very famous for explaining the 1870 ghost dance. Corbett told me what happened. I wrote it in an article. I'm famous. What a joke, <laughs> man. That's not a joke. But, but I was able to explain certain things about the 1870 ghost dance. And I'm cited everywhere and all that. And then I was able to, you know, talk about the 1890 ghost dance in ways that have given me, you know, an amazing reputation. I mean, people, I just got a call from San Antonio, Texas. A young woman is writing religious studies. And I spent hours saying, I don't think that's the case. Or I, I think maybe you're on the right. You know, I'm like a, you know, an old man who can give advice about it. Mm -hmm. And and it, it, it really created a reputation for me. And iron, you know, ir irony, you know, I mean, irony or how could this happen? How could these things fall together? Sometimes I think I'm the, you know, I was favored one. How come I to Yarrington? Maybe somebody else in Yarrington. The woman in Yarrington before me, she wrote a completely different study. Mm. I, why did I focus on drugs? Because I was a hippie. Mm -hmm. If I weren't a hippie, if it was, you know. It, it was just part of. Yeah, time. and it really, and then I said, nobody ever wrote this. So that's an ego thing, right? Chris, nobody ever, and you're the ones who did it. Well, that's an ego, that's an ego assertion. But I'm not mm -hmm. saying I wanted to be like King King of the Hill, the first one to discover this, and I'm going to devote my... I don't want to talk about drugs. I don't want to ever talk about it. Mm -hmm. My book... Yeah, I can. You know, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy, like, quote, the reputation. I, I, went, to, <laughs> I went to see um, Broken Treaty at Battle Mountain. Robert Redford was there. He did the narration, and it's all about this woman, Carrie Dan. Western Shoshone woman, and uh, and these people were fighting for a treaty, Treaty of Battle Mountain, 1863. They study they own the land, and they're fighting for the land. They're not going to get the land back from them. But the treaty says it's their land, basically. Mm -hmm. So tough, you know, tough noogies, man. Anyway, there's Carrie Dan, who was nominated for a Nobel Prize. She'll get one. When I walk into the room, she says, hey! Hey, did you bring any drugs? Here's that anthropologist. Hey, <laughs> did you bring any drugs? Come on over. I said, oh, gee. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, Robert Redford takes a look. So, so I, 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 didn't, I didn't dig that, you know, that kind of reputation. I did write the book about Corbett because I had a student who, who viewed me as a mentor, and he wanted it as a book for Nebraska. And then I said, all right, I'll do it. His name is Jay Miller. He's a wonderful student that I had. I've, I've had wonderful students. I taught from 46. I just was <laughs> with my wife in Manhattan and we were doing something with a lawyer and a guy comes up behind me, taps me on the shoulder and says, Professor Hitman, do you remember me? Um, I'm Dimitri, whatever. And he said, I took two, co two courses with you in 1983 and I'll never forget. The it's like, oh man, so for a teacher. Oh, that's the best that's yeah. the best feeling in the world. Yeah. So I give him a hug and I say, Dimitri, tell me what you're doing with yourself. And I, oh my God. And then I'm going to call him up, maybe have a drink with him. I'm going to call him mm -hmm. up because it's just, you know, it's just beautiful being a teacher mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. And, you know, I, teachers are having trouble today, Chris. 
like like a teacher has to say, I'm pro is Israel. I'm pro Israel. And then there's all this, you know, in sociology and in the social science, there, Max Weber was a very famous sociologist, and he developed the notion of value-free sociology. And the idea was the professor doesn't shoot his mouth off saying, I like drugs, I don't like drugs, I like Jews, I hate Jews, I like Pol because students are very impressionable. So the professor has to somehow stand. So, I, I, you know, professors have values and we're not robots, but there was a reason for that. And today everybody's, I mean, I, I had a student, I hope people are listening. I had a student who came to me and says, Professor Hitman, I've had many students come to me um, to talk to me about other professors, just about their bewilderment. And like one, I'll never forget this one student came to talk to me and said, Professor, I'm taking this class in English with so-and-so. And, -so, and uh, she announced in class that she's the most persecuted person in the world. So I said, well, I'd like to meet her. You know, everybody feels persecuted to some degree. What'd she say? She said, well, first of all, I'm a woman. And second of all, I'm a Jew. And third of all, I'm a lesbian. So I said, I said, if she was in a wheelchair, she, you know, she could add that. And then she'd be even four times persecuted. Mm -hmm. So what's the point? You mm -hmm. know, said so standing up in front of the students. And, you know, so this is what I believe in. I don't believe in God. Or I, if I taught the Bible class, students would want to know, do you believe in God? So I said, oh, come on. Let's do that at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. We had to talk about the Bible. It's an amazing mm -hmm. book about these mm -hmm. people and how did they live. And let's, let's do it. We'll do that at the end. I, I don't know. And I said, I don't even know enough to answer your question. <laughs> Honest to God. But I did have fun with them because, you know, the, the Jews never write. They leave the, the Hopi Indians never close a circle. Mm. You always have to leave room for the spirit to escape. In the Southwest, if you see artwork, it's like, come on, finish the circle. Like you would tell your kid, he's drawing circles. Can you mind if I draw a circle and I always stop? And you say, what are we stopping for? Close the circle. You know, hey, you guys, let's go. Ah, you have to leave room for the spirit to get out. It's a very spiritual thing. The Jews, when they write God, they always leave a letter out. Because if you could put the letter in, then you could probably control <laughs> right? So um, with my students, I would have so much fun with them because I would write G-D and students would say, Professor, you didn't spell it correctly. So I said, you have four, you have five choices, five vowels, A-E-I-O-U. I don't know. What do you think it is? <laughs> God, Gid, Gad, Gid. I said, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and then I'd have some of the stuff I'd have fun with. But, but you know, so well, th this business of, you know, of having a reputation uh, on that, I, I didn't like it. And then we get to the millennium. You know, I have a wife. Uh, I, I have two daughters. We, we, we live in Brooklyn. I spend a lot of time going back and forth to the reservation because I get hired as a consultant on, a, on wonderful projects. So now I'm not studying them like like the chairman of the, new, the, chairman of the University of New Mexico, a wonderful guy, he said, Mike, when you study them, they're bugs. I study the Eskimo, they're bugs. It's mm -hmm. like studying bugs. You have to have a scientific detachment as opposed to getting close to people, connecting, sleeping and... with them, loving them, you know. And, well, I didn't sleep with them. I did love them, but they're not bugs, man. They're not bugs. I, I mean, what kind of craziness is that? So I had a chance to do work for the tribe, not studying them. Uh, and I did, a, I did a lot of projects, a history project. There were a lot of, one day, once the boys got, once the boys were suspended for wearing long hair, some of the boys I knew, the school had a dress code, you couldn't have hair beyond the collar. Mm -hmm. And these Indian kids, when AIM became very popular, you know, the founder of AIM actually stayed with my wife and I, and we took care of him one night. He, he got drunk, he had the DTs. <laughs> we spent the night like in a nursing station. I'll tell you the name a little time. But he was one of the founders of AIM, the American Indian Movement. And all these kids were wearing long hair and they were, you know, wearing the flag upside down, mm -hmm. which offended, you know, cowboys. And um, so these kids get suspended and then there was a whole thing. I was called the moderator. So I went to the, with the tribe and it was great. I moderated between the DA and we talked about all kinds of things about cultural rights and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So I, and then the millennium came and Long Island University bought this radio station. And this is why I'm in South Hold. Mm -hmm. 
my family always used to, my wife's family always used to come to uh, Montauk and they always used to go to Shelter Island and my brother-in-law and my wife's brother bought a house in Shelter Island. And, and then LIU bought, LIU bought the Southampton campus uh, and created the Southampton campus and they started a radio station. It was WLIU and uh, it was 88.3. And uh, they they hired these two pretty well known people, Wally Smith, wonderful. I love Wally Smith, and and Bonnie Grice. I love Bonnie Grice. She's on the radio on <laughs> a different station, and they needed since there were three campuses, and since professors are no better than infants as siblings, because you got more than me. How come they're getting this and I'm not getting this and they're getting that mm -hmm. and they're getting this? Honest to God. I, and I, I was the chairman of a department, and I know they're just they're just a bunch of children, man. You know, they're just infants. You know, I want you got how come you got the cup, cup, you know. So because they had the they had the radio station in Southampton, the CW Post wanted one, and then the Brooklyn people wanted one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's not any more complicated than that. So in Brooklyn, where I'm teaching. And remember, I interviewed out in Southampton, and I was going to take a job out there. So some people that I know, my homeboys, said, if you need somebody to do a show in Brooklyn, ask Mike Kitman, because he knows all these jazz people. His brother was a jazz musician. He went to LIU as a jazz musician. His brother was a jazz musician. So they come to me, and they say, would you, would you, do, you, know, would you host a program? Uh, and I said, yeah, you know, what about it? He said, but we don't have any money. So I said, right away. <laughs> work for free back in my father's, you know, <laughs> work on Maggie's farm. Anymore. So I said, well, you know, we just want to do a couple of them and we'll see what it's like. And I said, oh, sure. Oh, no problem, man. And I knew some pretty famous people like Phil Schapp. And mm. I got some pretty famous people to come in. And I did eight programs. And I, I've interviewed Indians a thousand hours. So what I had to do was go to the books. Okay. And read about jazz, which I did. Ken Burns. Jazz, jazz series. Months. So I watched that and I took notes like I'm smart. I knew a lot about jazz through Charlie Jackson going back. You know, I was in Birdland. I, I knew a lot about it and I knew a lot through my brother. My mm -hmm. brother played all over in New York City. My brother put out a CD. My brother played paddle ball. For whoever's listening, my brother played paddle ball and he trounced Cedar Walton. Cedar Walton was one of the like 10 famous jazz piano players. Mm -hmm. my, my brother studied with George Coleman. My brother was tight with Sonny Rollins. I could drop a million names. Lonnie Hilliers and these people used to come around and I knew them, and but indirectly. And um, then my brother dies, my brother kicks it. Mm -hmm. So um, I used my brother's music as a tribute and I do seven pro or eight programs. And the guy comes back to me and says, hey, you're good. So I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I don't know what I'm doing, but I, I can imagine, you know, Chris, what you're doing. You make up some questions, you know, you have some sense of time, you look at the clock and you integrate some music. So I said, yeah, and I actually, I liked it. Yeah. So they said, but we can't pay you. So of course I said, well, reduce my course load. And then the vice president said, what is it with people like you? Don't you want to work? So I, what, I wanted to punch somebody out. Mm -hmm. How dare you say that to me? I do want to work. I would have done it for free. I wouldn't have done it forever for free because I don't have, I got a wife, I got kids. Mm -hmm. I got four courses to prepare. Come on, man, I, I'm not. They, they, and then they started paying me and they paid me $400 a show, which was not a lot, trust me, because I would take people to lunch. I'm not feeling sorry. I, I enjoyed it. I didn't expect to earn money. But I had to buy CDs. It's before the YouTube. Yeah. So I, on any show, I spent about 200, 150 on CDs. And then I would take people to lunch. And I don't tell you how many hours I prepared. Because every guest I had, I said, man, you know more about me than I know about me, man. Mm -hmm. So I started doing the show. And in doing the show, it's just like a whole new dimension in my life. Because my brother died. And I used to play the guitar. And uh, I found somebody and I said, maybe I'll take a few guitar lessons because I heard Billy Taylor play. And I fell in, the day my brother died was the worst day of my life. It was the only day I had a quarrel with a student. I made the mistake of trying to teach. And then I went and I heard Billy Taylor play a Charlie Parker song, Confirmation. 
And I said, oh, if I could play that on the guitar. So I met a teacher, it was a wrong teacher, and I started studying guitar. And then the jazz people at LIU, they had a jazz program. She said, Mike, you play the guitar. So I said, no, but I'm taking some lessons. <laughs> so she said, why don't you just come and work out with us, with the singers, because it's a jazz. So I started playing guitar, a uh, rhythm guitar, I think a solo uh, for the jazz singers. And I wound up doing 11 concerts. And I never made a mistake, I'm not bragging. I'm just, I was so petrified. I have total stage fright <laughs> as a teacher. <laughs> and in trying to figure out how to do the jazz show, I discovered, here we go, right? Reading a newspaper is this being famous for discovering opium. I discovered that Duke Ellington played the Brooklyn Paramount. Then I discovered Charlie Parker played the And then I start reading, and the more I read, the more I learn. So I said, why don't I root the show in the Brooklyn Paramount? So the Brooklyn Paramount was a, a, the world's first motion picture theater built expressly for the talkies. Mm. So here we go, history for a minute. Um, people, you know, all the films were silent, but a lot of them had music. They were shorts. So they would have a recording and they would play the film, you know, and the guy, the projectionist has to play the sound disc and run the run the film. And then they figured out how to put the, you know, the sound on the film strip. So now that's the jazz singer, Al Jolson, the first yes. film. And he, you know, and he says the famous lines, you ain't heard nothing yet, you know, and he sings. Okay, so now the, the talkies are replacing the silent films and the golden age of silent films. There was a golden age. They're beautiful movies. Mm -hmm. Every time I see a silent film, it's like, oh my God, those people really acted with the titles. Yeah. And this is so jive where you just say, you know, I won't say F, the F bomb. You say the F bomb 35 times, they call it a movie. What the yeah. heck do you do it? You know, mm -hmm. okay, there are great actors today. I don't, I'm Jack, I'm fluent. <laughs> but LIU uh, bought the Brooklyn Paramount in 1950. And the Brooklyn Paramount was built in 1928. And it was the first theater. You, you either have to re outfit a silent film uh, movie house, and it cost $20,000 to all the wires, or mm -hmm. you start from scratch. So the Brooklyn Paramount, there was the New York Paramount, the Manhattan Paramount, and still there, it's the Hard Rock Cafe on, uh, okay. on Times Square. Yes, Look up, it's yeah. got the Globe, yeah. and it's this hideous Hard Rock Cafe, this beautiful, and that was the headquarters of Paramount Films before it went. Is it, it's all covered up now, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, Paramount Films was there in Manhattan before Hollywood. Mm. Then they found Hollywood, they moved to Hollywood, and then this. What about the one in Queens? There's probably 1,200 Paramounts. Yeah. There's one you hear on the radio all the time. There's one in Staten Island, the Staten Island yeah. Paramount. But they're not always theater. Look, look. if you're going to make movies, you got to, you produce them, you, you need an exhibitor. So A, they have to come to you and say, would you show my film? And then we negotiate. Mm -hmm. How much are you going to show it? And how many days are you going to keep it? And I got to mm -hmm. get you a copy. Or I build my own movie theaters and I show it in my own. It's a closed, mm -hmm. closed shop. Paramount had 1,200 theaters. They showed their movies until the Supreme Court said it's antitrust. So the guys in Manhattan, Adolf Zucker, starts to expand into Brooklyn. There's the Brooklyn market. They build the Brooklyn Paramount. They have the Manhattan mm -hmm. Paramount, 1926, silent films. Then they built the Brooklyn Paramount, and it's going to be built for talkies, and then they outfit. And they show the opening film is Manhattan. This is one of the comedies. Because, you know, there's always irony. The first film at the Brooklyn Paramount, which is the first theater built for the talkies, was a silent mm -hmm. film. <laughs> Come on, man. Oh. I think it's kind of, it's humorous. And it, it doesn't make sense, you know, but the, the world makes sense and you have to make sense of it. The, the world sometimes doesn't make sense and you have to make sense of it. And if you're right, you're right. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. And it's good to be wrong. It's horrible to be right. <laughs> you know, it's nice to be right for the ego, but it's it's humbling. So how could they do this? Well, Manhattan, because Manhattan Cocktail doesn't exist as a movie. It disappeared. It's all celluloid. It was a fire. Mm -hmm. It's gone. But there are a lot of reviews of it and there are a lot of photographs from it. Apparently it had two songs in it. So it was this Al Jolson, the jazz singer in 1927, had several songs, 
He's just doing his. He wasn't in black. He, I think he was in blackface. You know how he always appeared. Yeah, yeah. And then he speaks. He speaks a couple of lines like you ain't heard nothing yet. So 1927. So the first film shown in the first theater that for talkies has no talking, not a silent film, hmm. but it has two songs in it, and and risque songs. This is good in my book. These songs today would not be sung on any television show. Mm -hmm. They're really dirty lyrics. Oh my God. But there was not the, the production code in those years. This is the pre code. Yeah. Yeah, it was 28, that was 31. Yeah. Fine. So they built this theater, and I said, I can't believe it. Every time I go to like the public library, you know, 42nd Street, and I just do this microfilm. I said, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> August 24th, 1929, August 25th, 19, you know, I went bleary eyed. If I were paid for every hour there, I, I would take you to lunch, which I'll take you anyway. But it's bizarre. Anyway, I documented it with a notebook. I just documented every day. And I said, why don't you do the radio show broadcasting from the Brooklyn Paramount? So I did. So it's jive. I did the show. I did about like 175. And anytime I could talk to someone who, for example, let me give you this one of my best examples. The most famous basketball team in the world were the Harlem Wrens, mm. Harlem Renaissance. Okay? They were the first Fab Five, the Michigan guys, the yes, Fab yeah. Five. They beat every white team. They're, they had like, the record was like 325 and four. <laughs> They traveled around the country. The Renaissance Ballroom in Harlem sponsored these five guys. And then the sixth guy was named John Isaacs. And they called him Boy Wonder. Mm -hmm. I met Boy Wonder. He was 90 years old, man. And somebody I knew met him and asked John. And John took the train down in the winter from Harlem on his own. I offered to pay for a car service. Mm -hmm. And I did an interview with John boy wonder isaacs about playing basketball on stage at the brooklyn paramount against the team called the brooklyn jewels he said oh man we trounced them chris and it's one of the funniest things i said john did you used to shoot underhand free throws the way they taught us so he looked at me he said come on man there's no other way to shoot a free throw i said but john look at all these guys they're all look at will chamberlain he said because he's stupid man he said mm -hmm. look at me you relax you let your hands down you just flip it up. He said, those guys are jive. They're just, they're letting the ego get in the way. Only Rick Barry used to shoot underhanded free throws. Yep, yep, I remember. <laughs> so I did, I interviewed John. I, And any time I had a chance, like Tony Middleton from The Willows, the singing group, or Herb okay. Cox from The Cleftones, hey, tell us about Alan Freed, tell me about Brooklyn Paramount. And so I'm like, I'm getting hooked on the Brooklyn Paramount is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then I, and I, I, when I'm in, I'm in. You know, you got to be in to win. You know, well, I'm in not to win. I don't know what I'm doing, but all I know is I'm in because it's fascinating me. Fascinating stuff. And curiosity is that, you know, kill the cat. Well, I got news for you. It resurrected a lot of cats too. You know, it resurrected this cat. And I said, this place is fascinating. I couldn't understand why the administration didn't do anything with it. And you said, when was it bought by LIU? So it was, it was, so it was opened in 1928 and yeah. it ran through 1950. Okay. In 1928, they show a film and they have vaudeville. Mm -hmm. You go to a show, it's a 66 minute vaudeville show. They have a trained bear on the stage, acrobats, <laughs> yeah. comedy couples, singing, bands, music, and pause, and then a film. And then get everybody out. I'm bringing in five five shows a day. Mm -hmm. The Paramount, the Brooklyn Paramount, the first week it had 200,000 200, people were there. Mm. There were a lot of theaters like that in downtown Brooklyn. The Paramount, the Albee, the Strand, the Lowe's wow. Metropolitan, the Fox. Competition was So fierce. many. Yeah, now the White Way is the White Way. Broadway is, you know, Manhattan is the world and, and then Brooklyn's the world. Okay, but, but we had vaudeville. We, the theater had vaudeville, and every mm -hmm. famous vaudevillian was there. Every famous person, you name anybody, like Bob Hope, uh, Milton Berle, uh, Jackie, Jack Benny, Fred Allen, Burns and Allen, oh my God, Fanny Bryce, every week. Mm. Because vaudeville was, 
you know, radio threatened everything because you could stay home and listen to music on the radio. Why do you have to go out? Yes. But if you wanted to see him, you'd go to a vaudeville show. So vaudeville in the 20s was already dying. Mm -hmm. Vaudeville's 1910, 1920, there's no radio. And radio comes in the 20s. And then vaudeville starts to die out. But these theaters, there's such competition. If you could, if you, you know, it's like, you know, like what my doctor said, you pay for what you get. You, you want the entertainment? You want to see Duke Ellington live? You can hear him on the radio broadcasting mm -hmm. from the Cotton Club on a wire. You want to see him live? You've got to pay. Mm -hmm. 25, 25 cents, by the way. <laughs> 25 cents, 50 cents. You Amazing. Know. Orchestra, mezzanine, balcony. And the Depression comes in. 19, as soon as the theater opens, the Depression hits. And then mm -hmm. nobody wants to pay for vaudeville. They're making 5000 It costs 20000 bucks to put on a vaudeville show. And the star would get like five or 7000 And then... You know, and money, you can't make, you can't, you know, you can't manufacture money. And vaudeville starts to die out mm. until it dies. So the, the history of the Brooklyn Paramount, it dies in 1934. And then they start showing two movies mm -hmm. until the end. There's a movie house. But, but they make, they figure it out that you can make money with shows like Alan Freed's rock and roll shows. Mm-hmm. So LIU now took over the Paramount in 19, I'm sorry, in 19, we took it over in 1950. And they took over the office building and they used it for classrooms and, you know, off, administrative offices, and they kept the movie theater going. So yeah. when I was an undergraduate, Michael Hitman, 1959, there was the movie theater, it opened at three o'clock if I wanted to go to see a movie and go in and after three, and it plays till midnight. And, and that's it, it's just boarded off and go to class. When I graduated, my mother and my grandmother, my father's mother, I sat in this row, like row six, whatever it was, in the orchestra of the Brooklyn Paramount, and on stage was the commencement ceremony. Mm -hmm. And then they shut the place down, and they decided to make a gymnasium uh -huh. out of the orchestra. That's a whole different story, which has to do with basketball, which I'll tell you in a second. But, but LIU then... They start making money from the shows. They they would make one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars for a week's show, and they're making sixty thousand from showing movies. So it's a very vital source of income. Mm -hmm. So they keep the place, and then they finally shut down the movies, and they finally you know destroy the orchestra, and they totally convert the place over. And uh, now fast forward, you know they, they they make a basketball court out of the orchestra. Yeah, and the team has a basketball team. I'll, I'll say something about that in a minute, but I'm like, why don't we bring this theater back? Why do you? I'm mm -hmm. doing this. This is amazing because every time I have a radio guest, I take them to the shell of the Paramount, and the guys would go like, "Wow, man, this would be great." So I started doing a couple of shows there actually. So I'm a professor. I'm running a radio show, and the theme is broadcasting the Brooklyn Paramount. The home mm -hmm. of Brooklyn, the home of you know films and vaudeville and rock and roll and jazz. Mm -hmm. That's my shtick, you know. Open it up, mm -hmm. and then bring the guest in with an engineer and sit down and talk about what's going on, what's your latest CD, what you're doing. You know, mostly it was a jazz program. Okay. So where I could introduce the Brooklyn Paramount, I did. But meanwhile, on the side, I started running shows and courses. So now, and I have a letter from Gene Bach that calls me like I should have been the next. <laughs> I love this letter. I'm sorry, radio listeners, turn away. Bro, as the podcast people, this is, I'm, 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 uh, Gene Bach, who did a great day in Harlem. I'll show you in my house, or I'll take a picture of it. She said, you are the greatest promoter. Saul Urock has nothing on you. I said, oh, wow. <laughs> so what were we doing? First of all, my wife and I were hosting jazz events in our house in Brooklyn, and we were going nuts because we would have 40 people come and we'd bring in top flight jazz musicians and we'd give them the door, $25 times 20. They'd get the door and we'd make, we'd cook and people would perform and nobody wanted to leave. And every musician <laughs> wanted to come back the next day because this was the more money, $800, I can't make this in jazz. And the people were living in Manhattan coming to see a house in Brooklyn, they won't go home. It's like midnight, go <laughs> home. 
home. I want to shut down. I'm not doing this again. For th-. And then my wife was, Meryl was the real support. So we did that kind of promotion. Mm-hmm. And then I was doing courses about the Brooklyn Paramount, one credit courses, and each of them came with a jazz concert or a vaudeville mm-hmm. concert or a rock and roll show or, you know, a, a, or just film stuff. So like once we had a silent film and there's an amazing organ there and uh, I'm, I'm like, I'm hot. To, and I start saying, I'm going to write a book and then I retire. And when I retire, bingo, no connection. But three of the richest men in the world, people in the world, go for the Paramount. Bruce Ratner, mm. $65 million. Wow. And then let's just say uh, maybe he had another divorce and maybe... The second one wanted a hundred million, and the first one got you know two hundred million. He backs out. Oh wow, the Paramount's coming back, and I'm working on this book. Mm-hmm. And then Prokhorov, who ran against the Senior Putin in Russia, mm-hmm. and I have to spit those words out. Prokhorov owned the Barclays Center. Bruce Ratner owned the Barclays Center, oh. where the Nets play basketball. Yes, yes. Okay, and then Ratner was going to take the Paramount and have acts there with a thousand seats. And as Bruce Ratner said, if you can play my Paramount, you could play the Barclays Center. Uh-huh. And then he backs out. And then Putin took it over. And then he backed out for whatever reason. He, he sold his interest in the Nets. And now Live Nation has it. And damn it, they did the work. Mm. So I can't write in my book that it's it might come back someday. I have to totally rewrite the introduction. That it's, because it's coming open. back. Yes. So the Brooklyn Paramount, mm. ladies and gentlemen, it's opening in March uh, 2024. It's no seats. It's going to have a thousand kids, excuse me for saying this, buying drinks, doing shots, jumping up and down on the floor, screaming for, I don't know, Bruno Mars, whoever, maybe mm-hmm. Taylor Swift, eating pretzels. And that's it. But there's other ideas at work. and But they're at least restoring, trying to restore They're restoring somewhere. the theater. No outside marquee. I have oh, okay. to put a box in. They're, they're doing whatever they're doing, not the original. I, I worked the with the original. architect on the original plans. It's, it's, it's you know, glasses half full or glasses half empty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good luck. It, this one's half full, but it's at least half full. Yeah. You know, it's and, not, it's better than it being knocked down or just than some skyscraper down, going in there. Nothing there. It was, a yeah. basco- it was a basketball court. And I played yeah. basketball with the faculty every week. Uh, big, on on that court, yeah, there's a big uh, scoreboard up. All the mesh that's there, the the, the 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 stage was gone. The balcony exists. The most amazing graffiti is in the balcony. I'll show mm-hmm. you pictures. I know famous artists were sleeping in the balcony. Mm-hmm. The mezzanine was destroyed. There was no orchestra. And it's, you you want to say one word about basketball and how this kind of ties together? Sure. It, because if we have a minute to do that, sure. I started off playing basketball in Hebrew school, shooting a set shot. You yeah. know, after this kind of retarded guy, Lenny Podman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How do you do this? A one-hand jump shot? What do you do? I don't know, man. I'm so screwed up. I don't know. But I love basketball. Um, I love the Knicks. I like them because, first of all, they had the first black player, Sweetwater Clifton. So, and, and I was old enough to go see Jackie Robinson. And, you know, I wasn't a fan of segregation. And Dodgers, we loved the Dodgers for bringing in Jackie Robinson in 1947. I saw him play in Ebbets Field well, once, twice. Took the fro- trolley car and all of that stuff. So, you know, feelings of my, my boyhood friend, Butchie Battle, and then Charlie Jackson was an African-American man. I, I love Charles. I just, I, I go to war for Charles. I once mm-hmm. did in a bar with his white wife and some redneck started in and I was ready to fight. I don't know how to fight, but mm-hmm. I, I would go to war for sure. So anyway, you know, I love basketball. And you remember, remember the Celtics were the, you know, the Celtics were the first team to have an all black team. Oh, really? Red Auerbach, who played for the original Celtics, who John Isaacs said, we trounced red, the, the original Celtics, the mm. best, those white boys. That you said the Harlem Reds, we beat the the Harlem Reds were in, in Madison Square Garden as the whole team was inducted as a team. There, hmm. there are videos of them. They were not like the Globetrotters, but there were these six black men who just, oh my God. Now, LIU, so basket, basketball was something that you liked before the NBA. You liked it or you didn't like it. Baseball was the game. 
football mm-hmm. was eh, you know, basketball's basketball is coming. It's it's coming up yeah. in popularity. And uh, I never could play football. We didn't have football stuff. Baseball was too rough because, but basketball is an indoor game. You could play it all the time. Mm-hmm. So I like basketball. Fine. LIU had the most, LIU, Long Island University had the most famous basketball team, probably in basketball history. They had the most famous coach, without exaggeration, named Claire B. And the Blackbirds were like the Harlem Wrens, who were professional grown men. LIU was college kids, and they had they won the NIT and the NCAA one year. They were undefeated. They they, they had the best the best players. Don't ask me why. Okay, <laughs> and they maybe were the first to have white, uh, black players. Mm-hmm. So, for example, they had a player who was considered, in his day, the Michael Jordan. You know, everything's in. He was six foot five, nineteen year old. He was the leading scorer in the country. His name was Sherman White. LIU had the best team, and they had Sherman White. And there's some videos of Sherman White at Madison Square Garden. You can't really see that much. All you see yeah. is a skinny, you know, six foot, six foot five guy, dominating. Mm-hmm. And I interviewed somebody named Charlie, something or other, Charlie Hunter. I forgot his name. He played against. He said Sherman White was the best thing. I was six foot ten. This guy said to me, I was six foot ten. Charlie Rosen. He said, I was 6'10 and called a White Hope. He said, I had to play against Sherman. He said, trust me, I shouldn't have been out there. I should have stayed home with my mother. (laughs) (laughs) But the points shaving scandal in 1951 hit America. Rock and roll was hit by the payola scandal in 1959. Payola, pay for play. You're a radio jockey. I want you to play my boys songs. I give you a tape. And I also give you a shopping bag of money. You play my mm. boy's songs. It becomes a popular thing in the country. You keep playing it 24 times. The teenagers buy the record. Then you do a show in the Brooklyn Paramount. And who do you think you feature in the show? So one hand's, you know, until the Congress said, this is payola. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Alan Free said, I never played music I never liked. They said, would you take a Cadillac to play a song? He says, depends on what color. He was a wise mm-hmm. guy. And yeah. Dick Clark was like the sm- most smarmiest person who ever lived. He couldn't stand rock and roll. He mm-hmm. had American Bandstand. Mm-hmm. And he, they all lip syncs. He would not allow blacks to dance in his show. He had to be only whites. He had black entertainers. They lip synced. And he had the most crookedest business, but he gave up everything. And yes, yes, like, yes, 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 I know. I shouldn't have done that. Yes, and Alan Fried was like right in your face. Mm-hmm. I didn't do it. I never took money to play. I only played what I liked. Mm-hmm. They gave me the money. Would you take money? You got to live in this world. Would you take a Cadillac? It depends on what... He had his jaw out to Congress. Yeah. And plus, he was a Jew. He was half mm-hmm. Jewish. And Dick Clark was the waspiest... You know, and and I... You know, and I'm not saying he's a bad guy, but he was a multimillionaire. He got out clean, squeaky. Mm-hmm. like, And Freed took the... Okay, that's the... But the point shaving scandal was the gamblers got to the guys like Sherman White and they paid them money to miss shots, not mm-hmm. to lose. So LIU never lost. I don't think they lost. I don't think they dumped. You, you know, like yeah. everyone's talking about dumping, dumping. They should, you know, whatever, the sports today, they, they should dump. You can't dump. You have to play as hard as you can. You'll get killed on the football field. If you lose, you know, maybe you're happy because you get the top draft choice. But they're not. But how about... How about just like fixing so you deliberately miss shots? Apparently, the coach did not know. I mean, if you're busy in the hallway talking to a gambler, like an I walk past, you're talking to a hooker, what do you think I think about? What, are you going for ice cream? Mm-hmm. You know, so the coach doesn't know. He's, he's busy, you know. But the boys were busy with the gamblers. That was obvious. Yeah. And the coach said, gee, I was surprised when Sherman missed the shot that he always makes. Oh, gee, I was surprised the ball went off his leg when he usually catches it after the fact. Anyway, they blow it open. That's the point-shaving scandal. So it's LIU, Kentucky, St. John's. But we took the brunt of it. Uh, Mm. Apparently, Cardinal Spellman, Frank Hogan is Catholic. St. John's was left alone. A lot of Catholic schools were left alone. LIU, which had these black players, two of them, Leroy Anderson and Sherman White. LIU took the brunt. Sherman went to prison. He went, 
and he and they found the money under his pillow. Mm -hmm. He got nineteen hundred dollars. He never spent a penny of it. Hmm. So it wasn't exactly, you know. But the gamblers would bring hookers, and they'd have the nineteen-year-old kids would have sex with the hookers. One mm -hmm. gambler used to hook. He pimped his wife. His wife was screwing these guys, mm -hmm. and these guys were World War II veterans. I'm taking their side. Guys, you're a World War II veteran. You're 25 years old. You've been through the Battle of the Bulge. You got a wife and kids. You got a college scholarship, no money. You're playing 18 games a year. You got no money. Mm -hmm. Where's the money from? Mm -hmm. Unless your wife works. So they, they, you know, the guys took money from the gamblers, yeah. either to fix game. So LIU lost the basketball program just when they took over the Paramount. Because what they wanted wow. to do was gut the, gut the stage. Okay, I mean, gut the orchestra and bring in basketball and have the stage show. So, mm -mm, 51, no basketball in LIU from 51 to 61. And then they shut the Paramount down, 61, 62. Then they bring back big time basketball. And then they've had big time basketball ever since. Uh -huh. So, basketball interfaces with that. So does color, so does race, so does Sherman White. I did a conference, Claire B's grandson came to me and said, Mike, Professor Hitman, would you? And I, I had the most amazing conference, and we had all these, Bernard King came, all these people came, and we talked about the payola, uh, about the payola, about the point, I'm going too fast, about the point <laughs> shaving scandal of 1951. And it was amazing. And uh, my buddy Sam Jones came, and he was very heavily recruited. We had a lot of pretty famous people. And it was, I thought it was amazing. It was an academic course. You would mm -hmm. sign up for a course. You'd meet all these people. And it was a day-long conference. And it was held in the Brooklyn Paramount. I got to talk about the Wrens a little bit. and Because what happened was when they shut down vaudeville, the guy who was the manager had booked basketball every week. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to go with your girlfriend to the movie theater, you know, your mother, your father, your boyfriend, your grandma, you, you, you could go, let's say, on a Friday night when... They have a, a movie and a movie, and then at 10.30, mm -hmm. a basketball game between two professional teams. Wow. So, wow. So, it, it, it vaudeville, you know, was replaced in a way by basketball, ping pong. They had some yeah. other, and then it was just double, double bills. And then in the 50s, all the rock and roll shows, and I'm prepared to say rhythm and blues became rock and roll because Tommy Jive Smalls, did a rhythm and rock show before Alan Freed coined rock and roll. And in the Brooklyn Paramount, there was Tommy did, he was a famous disc jockey. He did three shows, all black performers. Mm -hmm. And then Alan Freed came in and did nine shows. And Clay Cole did two shows. And Murray the K and his swinging <laughs> soiree, who he was also got in trouble for payola. He did a show. And, there, it was, and then there were all these jazz shows in the 50s. So LIU was doing well in terms of showing movies and getting 60,000 a year from Paramount, mm -hmm. from three to midnight, and then booking the, the stage mm -hmm. and the place for the rock and roll shows. And then the whole thing shut down and they took it over. And that's another story about the university. We come well, full circle. Yeah, so uh, did you wanna say anything else about your book? I, I would say this closing out, in, in my retirement, Okay, in my, you know, these wonderful years, the golden years, um, I, I was able to get a book uh, about Campbell Ranch Reservation. I always wanted to write a book about Campbell Ranch, two books, oh, three books. One about Campbell Ranch because it was a commune. Now, the hippies, I talked about the hippie years and about marijuana, and the hippie years also involved communes and kind of idealistic life. My wife lived in a commune. I didn't live in a commune. But Campbell Ranch, this reservation during the New Deal was set up with 12 ranchers who had to share a bull. Good luck. Mm -hmm. 12, each one has a herd of cattle and one bull has to go around and impregnate. Oh my God, good poor bull. But it's a story of a commune that fell apart. So I always wanted to write that story. And I think I have a publisher for it. I did the book several times and I've, that's gonna, I gotta finish it up and whatever. And then I've been working like, like a demon on this uh, Brooklyn Paramount book because all of a sudden they're opening up in March. Mm -hmm. And they say they would like to have the book to market it. But so far, I haven't had a bite. And I, I don't know what's going <laughs> to happen with the book. And, and, I, and I've been finishing up, actually, last sentence. Um, 
when when I was involved in like a love triangle, and uh, the guy was a writer, and something stopped, something went crazy inside of me, and I started writing short stories, and I really lost my mind for a while, for whatever motivation I was just writing, I was just turning them out like a, they weren't finished stories, they were interesting, they weren't good stories, but they were not from the University of Iowa. I never went to, I'm an autodidact. I mean, I have a PhD in anthropology, so as an anthropologist, you know, I'm polished and all of that. I can talk, I can, I can talk that stuff, man. <laughs> but I can't talk fiction the way people, the way they write in The New Yorker and stuff like that. And I've had, like, I only had one story published and won a prize. I've been on and off writing stories. I was able now, I have a collection of stories called Never Wake a Sleeping Shaman. And, Bunch of different people have it, and we'll see what happens. And I have a collection of stories about, it's called Jazzers. Everything I know about jazz, I put into eight stories, and I don't know what's gonna happen with them, but uh, you were kind enough to help me print the, the stories, Never Wake a Sleeping Shaman. <laughs> and uh, so I'm busy trying to promote a book. I'm trying to finish my Paramount book. And, I, and I'm very, very close. I'm about two weeks away from saying I'm done, but it needs a copy editor. I need a layout person. One person wants seventy-five thousand dollars. So you listening? Seventy-five thousand dollars, <laughs> man. You know what you can do? Somebody else wanted eighteen thousand. If I can find a publisher, they'll take care of the cut. So there's issues like copyright and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then I was frankly, I've been promised the moon by these people at Live Nation, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm a sucker for love. If you invite me for coffee, <laughs> I go. If you say you want to marry me, I'm going to marry you, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, I do believe what people say. And mm -hmm. I know that there are hustlers and hucksters and liars. I never lied to anybody. I mean, well, once I did, but you know, <laughs> I don't. I don't say things unless it's. So I've really been like big eyes, like really. I tell my wife, oh wow, you know this person, so and so. They say they want to publish the book and help me get it published. Yeah, but when? I said I don't know. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's my sign off, Chris. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. No, and thank you, and I wish you the best on the book and. It was great hearing all your stories and everything you're doing right now. And hopefully we can have you back on again. Bravo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. From your words. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, part two with Michael Hitman today. And I want to thank you all again for listening to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast. And we'll see you next week.